Right, okay, now. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Welcome to Gold Chakra number seven. I'm Kiran Butt. I am an Indian American polyglot author and traveler. And today I'm going to be, as always, the moderator, but I'll be playing a little bit with that moderating role. And I will be like taking some questions on my multi location streaming novel, Hidar, which is actually going to start streaming stories tomorrow. Joining me is the lovely Rochelle Potkar, who I met all the way back in Macau last uh, two years ago now. I can't believe it's now two years. She'll be talking about a lot of her multi-location stories, poems, and fiction writings, as well as hopefully some non-fiction maybe as well. And then we also have Anuradha Kumar, who will also be joining us today from the lovely New Jersey. She's written a lot of novels, stories, and also nonfiction, and we're excited to have her. And of course, we are very grateful for Karan Madok, who is our lovely host of the Chakra. Karan, would you like to tell us a little bit about your space? Uh, thanks, Kiran. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, my name is Karan Madhok. I'm the editor and founder of thechakra.com. We're an Indian arts review. And we've been doing these Go Chakra series courtesy of Kiran for now. As, as he said, this is about, this is the seventh time we're doing it. We, we do a monthly series and really excited for this one because, you know, we, we can talk about place in an Indian concept, but we can also talk about place in a global concept. And Kiran, your novel speaks to that. Uh, the work, the rest of you, the work that Roshal and Anuradha have, have done speaks to place in such an international way too. So I'm really excited for the session. And um I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, before we finish, Kiran, I hope you can remind people to make sure to like subscribe to our yes, yes. Uh, our mailing list so they can get information for future Gold Chakra events too. Uh, yes. With that, Kiran, please do take it away. Yeah, yeah, of course. Please, um, everyone, please, um, if you're interested in the content we're going to put out, uh, please put your email down in the chat box and we'll later put it onto our mailing list. So that way you can get our future like Gold Chakra events and also when we publish stories and writing and whatnot. All right, wonderful. Well, just some house rules for the people who are here. You know, keep yourself muted as long as you can. <laughs> Don't uh, maybe uh, speak out of turn. If you have a question, use the raise hand button and um, I'll try to get to it as soon as possible. Feel free to write in the chat and make yourself present, but uh, we would ideally like only the speakers to be speaking for now. All right, uh, let us start with Anu. Anu, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, what you're writing about, where you're coming from? And maybe yeah, what the places are that you define yourself with? Uh, that's a huge question. But yeah, hello everyone. Uh, nice to be here with uh, Rochelle, Kiran, Karan, and all, all of you. Okay, so uh, I don't know honestly where to begin. So uh, since uh, Kiran suggested that it could be fluid and uh, you know uh, and free flowing, I, I thought I would just uh, read first from uh, this novel that just came out from Yoda. Uh, the hottest summer in years. Uh, I mean, I know summer is already where in India, but uh, this this uh, the story of this book is set in many places, uh, uh, starting from Raukela, a town in uh, central India, uh, central India, and then it moves to southwest Africa, and it veers to Berlin in Germany during the last days of the Second World War. It moves a bit to Brazil, to South Africa, and then it comes back to central India. Not in any um, you know. Uh, conscious, uh, conjectured way, but uh, again, it's a fluid uh, novel. And uh, the places that I construct are, are, are entirely from memory. Let's say I construct them from uh, photographs I saw in my parents' black and white albums, from the stories I heard, and uh, from uh, the things that I've read before about them. I, I know what, what drew me to writing about the past to places I uh, know only from memory and from history, but I guess in a way it was to uh, resurrect uh, the story of the previous generation, the story of my parents when they were young. And uh, this is entirely fictitious, of course, though it's based uh, on things remembered and received knowledge. So with that, should I just uh, read out for five minutes? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. We can do okay, it. Okay, thank you for your time. Okay. So I'll just uh, begin with the first chapter. There's a prologue before it, and uh, it's called The High Sea, the first chapter. The year was 1960, and that summer of May, my first in that hot Indian city. In the west of Africa, my childhood home, the sun had never been so merciless, so very steadfast in its attention. Later, as the drama of Ahmed Ali's murder unfolded, I would learn that it had been one of the hottest summers ever recorded. I had arrived only some months ago in a mild winter. The other Germans, the engineers from crew, and the maintenance staff had already been there for a year and more. 
It was a time when the Saar forests were still being cut down and the shouts of the lone crane operator could be heard as the bricklayers, sullen at their work, built the new quarters for the steel plant workers. They were working overtime and at night their soft conversation could be heard over the buzz of the kerosene lamps in their, tan in their tents and the unfinished construction site, the moths singeing themselves and falling with the faintest of hisses. You could also hear the clink of glasses and laughter from the new officers club that had been officially appointed to manage. Appointment as club manager and so the letter that had arrived for me in Durban had begun. After listing in a banal way all that the job entailed, stock keeping, maintaining logistical control and setting up an efficient team of local people who would soon learn German, it ended with a pious benediction. Make it a home away from home for your fellow Germans. I would look often enough at the letter in my early days. I had kept moving from one place to another before that time and no place had been home. Nothing in me felt German, though for a time, more than being German, I had been the replica of another German, a hated one. To take on oneself a hatred that was due someone else, to become someone else entirely is a feeling that is hard to shake off. Late, when all the noise had died, you could hear the jackals come stealthily out of the jungle. I would wake from my nightmare thinking that they had come for my long, nebulous, undecided self. I would almost wish that they had come for the part of me I longed to tear away from, the man I once resembled, the coward in me that hadn't been able to fire in time. When the ship had lurched, I had lost my footing and I felt the spray on my face, but this time it was the sweat on my cheeks, my clammy palms that woke me. Then more fully awake, I would wait for the stray shout or two, or the thud of a stone that would be soon, that would be enough to scare the jackals away. When I emerged from the dark room where I kept my photos and slept on a low mattress on the wooden floor, all I would see was that one bright light from the Raja Sahib's palace filtering through the trees, fading but never going away. That meant, as I would learn in a few days' time, that Lisa was awake and up late reading. But in the darkness before I knew Lisa, I saw only how the light blinked every time the leaves moved, sighing in the breeze. The shifting moon played with the shadows, the jackals howled, steel fell from the slags. All through that hot summer, as the steel plant came up and I worked hard to get the club going, Lisa led read long into the night and it made her late for the high tea that afternoon at the palace when I finally met her. I, I would come to think that everything of significance to me occurred in the same ordinary way. Events unwrapped themselves before me, slowly, one after the other, and I witnessed it like a lone member of the audience, always on the margins. That is how I had felt when I was invited to high tea at the palace. The other guest that afternoon was Ranjay Das, the district's new superintendent of police. He had arrived in the town only a fortnight before me. But as he had explained to me twice before, once at our first meeting in his office and later in the club, he knew the palace grounds well, not the palace itself. Decorum, he had said, and his hat had shifted to a jauntier angle. And then he had gone on to say in a deliberate laconic tone, fingering his bow tie, that his father's position had never allowed him access to privileged spaces. No entry into the sanctum sanctorum, he said laughing, his teeth a, a flash of sly white on his swarthy face. I think my five minutes got over, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, I was about to <laughs> make that comment. That being said, I do have some questions, but I'll leave it for after. Um, Rochelle, would you be willing now to maybe give us a little bit about yourself and then read for five minutes? Yes, so uh, Anu, thank you for that wonderful reading and we, are, we were totally immersed in that place. We have a lot of questions coming up for you. Okay, but I would like to thank uh, Kiran, Karan and Golchakkar and, uh, and say hello to the audience. And Golchakkar, you know, is uh, so related to space actually, Kiran, if you notice, because it's, it's situated at the, you know, the center of the crossroads and where at least in Bombay people will say, no, no, left, leke, right, leke. So I like the fact that it's absolutely pertaining to space. Uh, so talking about a uh, place, uh, my book of uh, short stories, Bombay Hangovers, which is currently released, is all about place. So if I have to read uh, for, a f for a few minutes, uh, I've chosen this story called Noise. Because when I interact with a, with a place, uh, I interact uh, as a citizen uh, with sensoria. And the sensorium is in all five senses, of course. So Bombay being teeming, a city teeming with ants and bees, 
uh, when Bombay seeps into me, uh, it seeps through its sight, smell, sound, taste, I don't know, and claustrophobia, space, sweat. So all ways that Bombay could seep in, of course, it's characters, it's, it's myriad characters, it's vibrant characters, it's mad characters. So I'm just choosing one element from the palette, which is uh, the title of this story is Noise. But to logline the story, it is about the noise in the city, which is a character, of course. But the story is about a, a mother who is waiting for a son who has gone away, never to return, perhaps, while she's take, looking after a son who is unwell. He's 57, but he's three in his head. Uh, and this is her story, but it starts with the son who leaves uh, in Mahim. Years earlier, the city had gotten into him. Every morning, Jonathan D'Souza wore a blue shirt, gray tie, black trousers, and ate the same kind of egg. His mother Kay put forth a sunny side up to him. He liked breaking the yolk, seeing its stickiness spill out. The noise from the roads below swelled with Russia honking. Its screeching and beeping induced a liminal sonic pentameter in him. There was a rhythm in his steps as John walked to work. It would take 30 minutes from Mahim to Bandra if the footpaths and promenades were clear. But beggars and hawkers crowded the footpaths. The promenades were partly filled with secondhand cars ready for sale. And the traffic was unmoving at best to the slow choreography of tricolored signals. This made for an hour's long walk to Hill Road. Today was the same march, like always. John felt the morning's heat over his skin. He could tell the time by the amount of sweat sprouting from his back, the way his vest and shirt were wet. He glanced at his watch. Same time every morning, 9.20 a.m. Only today, he looked at the road leading to Bandra train station. He stopped and stared at the forked road for a while, then slid off the sling of his back, sling off the back. keeping it by the keeping side of a lamppost. He rolled up his cuffs, loosened his tie, and walked over to Bandra station, boarding the first train that came to his platform. The train was heading in the opposite direction of the business centers, but was just as crowded. At Andheri, Hurried travelers pushed him out. He fell to the concrete on all fours and passerbys hurriedly helped him to his feet. From there, he went across the overhead bridge and boarded an outstation train. In this long blue train were a few empty berths. The train began to pick speed and it rocked him into a trance. Before he knew it, John slid over the lowest berth and went to sleep. It was a deep sleep. When he woke, he went to the door and stood staring at the landscape. Tall buildings had changed to short buildings, small houses, and then just trees. It had been 14 hours. The land was flat now and green and brown. No trees, no thought, just the amusement of being alive. John went back to his birth and slept for all the times in his life he had missed sleeping because of Wilson. The noises Wilson made did not disturb the neighbors of the building, but it would wake John up in that quiet hour, even if he used cardboard and thermocol bits as wedges in the gaps of his closed door. Mother Kay felt bad about this, but she was never going to send Wilson to a care home. Giving him even half a sleeping pill gave him reactions. Once he didn't wake, until noon, once he didn't sleep until noon, and once he didn't speak the whole day. Yeah. First of all, Rochelle, you are, you, you're such a convincing reader. <laughs> I really felt like I was in Bombay. And I mean, I, I mean, everyone likes to say these types of things when they're being, you know, they're trying to, you know, talk to people who are reading and doing it well. But really, I felt like it Really, thank got, you, thank you. Uh, what Come to Bombay when the pandemic ends. I, that's the plan, but <laughs> but how long that is, one doesn't know. How is it that you got yourself in such a place that you could, like, were you just observing traffic and observing things and really recording it, or was there some other type of way that you got to this intensity of place? 
Uh, as I mentioned, Kiran, uh, because uh, the city of Bombay, I've lived a long, long time here. I've been a citizen for a long time, and the city seeps into me in all five senses. So it, 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 you know, inks itself out in all five senses. <laughs> That's how I can put it. And the city is really a maximum city of sens sensoria. <laughs> so it's it's a good place for an author to kind of be drenched in feeling. Yeah, I think uh, all of us yeah. who have an experience with Bombay will agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I um, I also yeah. like to you know, share you. Uh, you were able to uh, show the exterior world, what John sees outside, and also the interiority of him, what he experiences within himself. So I, I liked how you mentioned the exterior and the interior voices into your narrative. Quite fascinating yeah. and quite skillful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anu. Thank you so much. This means so much. Yes. And I wanted to ask Anu, I think for your book, it's interesting because of the way that you're dealing with multiple places and the kind of stitching of those places in one narrative. And I had a lot of questions in regards to that. First is like, why a German perspective? Why German? Why Germany? Why also then this placement in India? Like, what were the different things that kind of came in your head to make this come together? Okay. Uh, well, it's a big question, so there, there could be a long answer. <laughs> yeah, that'd be succinct. So, uh, essentially, uh, you know, um, I wanted to. I mean, there are many things that, I mean, Rochelle and you will know, there are many things that goes into the making of a novel or a story. And it, it all changes as you write the story and as you go back to it. So having said that, I, I wanted to uh, write a story about, about the time when my parents were younger, when my father was an idealistic police officer, when my parents were newly married. And uh, yeah, uh, and this was a novel actually I, I began about uh, more than a decade ago. And I went back to it only about uh, three years ago or so after my father had passed on. Somehow I felt I wanted to uh, remember or recreate uh, the time when he was uh, a young man, a time even before me, when I time, a time when I didn't even know him. I just wanted to recreate that period. And uh, second or maybe third reason was uh, this period of uh, early post-independent India, you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, I find very fascinating because it's about a, a new country with new dreams uh, and new hopes. And uh, uh, Raurkela was like one of these towns where um, we saw a lot of planning, we, we saw a new industry come up uh, in an area which was still uh, kind of uh, uh, agricultural and even feudal because the, uh, there was a king there and stuff like that. I, I, I wanted to see how, it, uh, how, I could, how, how I could tackle that narrative. And German, yes, because the steel plant in Raurkela was set up with West German and American help. And my parents had all these stories about their German friends, the German colleagues, and what a totally different lifestyle they had. And it seemed like not just a foreign literal sense, but in a metaphorical sense as well. Uh, and I wanted to get it all together. But and as I wrote the story, obviously it, it didn't have my parents' point of view, nor did it have, uh, nor was it written from the point, point of view of an Indian, but uh, from a German's point of view and an uprooted German because Hans Gerda, the, the protagonist, never actually grows up in Germany, but a German colony in the Southwest of Africa, where Germany did have a colony in the early 20th century. So I guess it was a mix of uh, historical and uh, uh, my own, um, you know, grow, uh, my own feelings as, as a writer as to how to tackle this theme of, uh, you know, moving movement of growth of uh, of uh, many many literal things actually that went into uh, this novel, a potpourri of things uh, actually. So yeah. yeah, and a potpourri of questions are now coming to me. I think one question I think is most immediate is. How did you get into the perspective where one, you could imagine German mentality, but then also from a South African perspective, like what were the sorts of research that you did or what were the sorts of things you did inside of yourself to get into that headspace or that imaginary? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, first, uh, did I find it difficult to write from the point of view of a, of a, of a man, of a male character? Uh, probably, but you know, uh, inadvertently or otherwise, uh, I I've been doing <laughs> I've been doing this. I, I mean, you could say as a writer, uh, you know, one steps into uh, shoes of other characters, but that's easier said than done. Uh, is that uh, for the last decade or so? Again, I've been writing these historical fiction books, uh, um, 
on India's three great emperors uh, in ancient India, you know, Chandragupta and Vikrama. So again, uh, from a uh, from a total male perspective, and uh, how to get into their shoes and, and you know, right, uh, right as if I were a brave, swashbuckling, heroic uh, monarch, and how did a man think of such situations and uh, the challenges he 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 was faced, he he met. Uh, so. So writing from a male perspective is always a challenge and quite difficult. I don't know whether I've done that. And yeah, writing as a German, one way I did uh, want to get, a, I tried to get it on that was uh, Hans Goethe doesn't actually grow up in Germany, but he grows up uh, as an outsider in all the places that he has been, whether it's uh, um, Namibia, modern day Namibia, which was once German Southwest Africa or in Brazil, or even when he goes to Berlin in the last days of the Second World War, he's always an outsider. And being an outsider has helped me because uh, uh, like Hans, or, although I've not had a similar trauma, I, I've moved on in many places, including Bombay, Delhi, Orissa, Singapore, uh, and now the US. And uh, uh, and having the outsider's perspective, I, I could relate or empathize with somebody like a Hans Gerda. Uh, and I, I guess uh, that empathy helped. Uh, I guess it's for, for my readers to tell me whether I've been successful. But yeah, uh, <laughs> I know that I'm answering your questions well, but uh, it's yeah, but always it's something a, one is thinking through. Yeah, It's, it's hard as well, because you yourself might not know like how well you pulled it off as well. It's just something you attempted and you only hope for the best, as all of us I, do. But um, Rochelle, I want to ask you as well, like, um, first of all, were there any characters in your book that you had trouble creating or you had to kind of reimagine from a place context or from a gender context or from a nationality context? And if so, what was the work you had to do to get there? So, uh, so because uh, uh, this is a collection of 16 stories and all of them are based in Bombay. But uh, if you look at the sub themes, uh, it, it of course it of course covers sexuality because i think sexuality for me is a recurring theme probably a conversation or a debate for life it's a lifetime theme but uh, there were other themes like you know urban claustrophobia and uh, the spaces we find ourselves in especially because this is an island city and it's always congested and you always feel uh, there's not enough space and it's only in the lockdown probably when you realize that the space was never about it the outside it was about the inside as to how free you felt in a cage so that's the same thing you feel in the city but urban claustrophobia was another theme and um, um, then as I said you know the noise the smell if you notice uh, there would be uh, like I had deliberated on uh, smells and perfume in one of the stories which was called perfume which Anu was referring to which excerpted in scroll mm -hmm. and uh, noise was the one I read from then I went, go into history about the textile mills and when they closed what happened to one of the characters called Kailas Ranade who becomes just a watchman of a mall because he's still connected to the same land on which the mill first existed but the mill and the mall is not just you know these monuments but they were his dreams the mill was his dream he wanted to rise up to become somebody in that mill it was a it was a dream of dignity so there are a lot of these uh, you know uh, sub themes and if i look at them uh, the characters that you witness in a city like bombay uh, if you hang out enough with them or observe them or, or read them because sometimes i feel people are books you know and if you read people enough they are the biggest books never ending books that you could find they are not characters they are books so um, I think that all seeps in. You feel it. You you know the city. You know what what is ticking. You know you know the the noise of the Arabian Sea, the shore. They say the shore of the shore. You know, and um, uh, yeah, the city is constantly ticking, tick 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 tick. Only now it's gone a little quiet because of the pandemic. But otherwise, Bombay was always this tick 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 tick. You could hear it. Um, in the footfall maybe or in something it gives you the sound of a ticking clock so yeah so all these things but very uh, witnessed and experienced uh, some of it of course imagination because you know uh, reality is boring it may be stranger than fiction but it's also very boring so uh, 
at that time of course imagination comes comes to use because you always ask these questions as a writer what if what yeah. if not yeah so yes and as, as you said reality is stranger than i mean reality is more boring than fiction so what we as fiction writers try to do is to create something that is so like a engrossing and compelling that it almost makes us want to be more a part of it than reality itself you know we're trying to transcend reality through the, the power of words which is yeah. its own thing <laughs> its own attempt perhaps it's, it's interesting rochelle you uh, you mentioned that you have a story set in the mills and malls avita two years ago i i did write a book on bombay uh with speaking tiger published which also had this uh, it was actually it's a uh, a book of interlinked uh, stories uh, with the lead narrator moving across the stories and essentially it's about uh, how all of them come together to one of the themes of it was to uh, save a mill from uh, being sold to the real estate sharks it was called uh, coming back to the city i think that's lovely that's wonderful and uh, and that is so uh, so important right i mean that's one very important historical uh, bookmark of the yeah. city it does reference the same textile mill strike that yes. you talked about that changed the city's uh, complexion so so much in the early 80s yeah and even yeah. before that the 60s when uh, you know there were these uh, maybe it's controversial the political parties fighting for space and uh, the labor mills and the labor unions uh, became sort of victims in in this whole struggle but right. yeah. but why uh, if i may ask a question why bombay hangovers because the, hangover hangovers gives uh, a texture of uh, looking back or recovering from something or uh, right, right, i mean right. i would ask you to speak about the title of your collection why hangover yeah yeah so so very very quickly and simplistically put uh, you know the title first was a very long one it was called uh, debacles from a bombay hangover or something like that and my publisher said you know sab pagal ho jayenge and i was like 12 baj gaye like you know sabke chehre pe so i was trying to shorten it definitely and when i thought of bombay hangovers when i shortened it uh, i feel it it did resonate with the stories in the sense that uh, even though you know I, i was mentioning this at at a conversation on this book earlier in the month that uh, as a small town girl because i i lived in the satellite town of kalyan okay mm-hmm. so i was very close to bombay and bombay was always this aspirational city okay when i went to when i go to bombay this is going to happen when i go to bombay magic will happen when i go to bombay i'm going to be very free all those things but coming to bombay i realize that i not never reached bombay or mumbai because um, this is like the castle of Fran- franz kafka only you get the castle you live in the castle and you're like but where's the castle you know so it's that kind of a thing that the aspiration keeps moving on the horizon because it's a horizon uh, so um, uh, so so basically you never get over the intoxication you have a hangover while being intoxicated <laughs> so i thought this makes sense because i'm still intoxicated with bombay but i have you know had my catharsis by writing these 16 stories because you write these stories and you get the city out of your system in a way but you still are hung over it in the realm of this intoxication so yeah that's yeah. what it is so one thing i wanted to ask interestingly enough it uh, parallels with this conversation it's more for anu i think than rochelle is how as someone who writes largely a lot of historical fiction uh, how is it that one creates that space to which you're writing about the past you're writing about something that happened but you're creating it in a way that has relevance to readers of now or today like how is it that you transcend the timeliness of a place to create timelessness okay um yeah uh one philosophically one answer to this would be that the, the the struggles uh, remain the same you know the struggle to uh, to save our essential humanity or how to be good or how to lead a good life these are these have been questions asked since the time of uh, marcus aurelius since uh, chanakya's time right down to the present and how we battle these questions how we debate within ourselves how we confront evil uh, even even the face of evil actually um, hasn't changed much i mean we recognize fascism when we see it and stuff like that but like, so yeah so historically the struggles universal and within us uh, hasn't changed much but um, about ensuring timeliness uh, something that uh, rochelle might relate to because she talked about smells and noise and uh, uh, you know the values that we uh, hold dear 
it, it, the challenge would be like suppose i'm working on a historical novel set in chandragupta maurya's time which is uh, 2000 years ago uh, so to make uh, uh, the place as uh, relatable to a present day reader would be not just to describe the place but to describe uh, the everyday events or uh, the uh, the smells the taste the noise uh, the bazaar conversation uh, the life of the common people and uh, you know so that a person can see it visualize it walk around in it and uh, bring it alive in every sense so that it's visual it's cinematic it's sensual um, it's alive in every sense so uh, that that's how i work around it uh, and uh, with this novel set in 1916 in india uh, it was also more important because uh, it's our immediate history which is in danger of being forgotten and one just sees the larger picture but not uh, the smaller picture of how a small new uh, of a small town came up and how it industrialized because this is also the picture of a newly independent india so uh, i i i saw that as a challenge as well because that immediate history is being forgotten and uh, I blame for a lot of things at present. Uh, sorry, I seem to bring <laughs> politics into everything. So uh, I, I wanted to get that period alive and to talk about a small town in the in a big new India, independent India. So you know, very valiant, and it's a really small. That's small. that's very interesting, Anu. And and I I wonder if I can gate crash and you know talk about Kiran's uh, Kiran's book, oh. which we were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Girar, right? Yes. You know, Girar, am yes. I pronounced? Yes. And what about uh, you yeah. reading? Uh, yeah. As you continue the questions with Anu, but you know, like oh. we are also waiting for your reading. Oh, that's so sweet of you. Okay. Well, I was thinking um, since uh, normally we have the two readers talk and then we have a Q and A, but since um, we were you, you both really want to hear me read. I was thinking we would do the first forty minutes you two, and then I would jump in okay. at the very last and replace the Q and A. Right. Is that all right? all right? I thought that was a more. That's more perfect. Specific. That's perfect. I just wanted to check. You know, just check on that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You know, I thought about it, but I want to do it in a way that that way I'm not taking away from your time either. So I just want to make sure that. Yeah. Uh, please continue. Please. Yes, continue. But please, yes. So I want to say that's very valiant, Anu, because really I think that's an interesting idea of taking like, and it's a true thing as well. We forget there's so many small towns, so many small editors that get kind of usurped by the narrative of history. So sometimes as fiction writers, we protest that by deciding to create the narrative again for people to remember and say the small little thing that you might not be thinking of on a global scale is actually more important than you give it credit for and here's my chance to give it to another audience and give it a new light so it's interesting i'm looking forward to reading this story and reimagining Urkula as well which is this town that i knew like in the back of my head but i've never like thought of in the narrative context is there also this need for you, Rochelle, to kind of narrativize Bombay? Yeah, I, uh, yeah, but yeah, no. Before your question, I just wanted to ask Anu about the title. You know, how do you, uh, how do you come about with the titles of your book, Anu? Oh, uh, that's a very, a very uh, interesting question. <laughs> uh, this was the easiest title uh, that I came up with. And, and of course, for the historical fiction novels, it was easy. Emperor Chandragupta, Emperor Vikram, <laughs> you just like fat everywhere. Uh, no extra work needed but otherwise uh, i don't know I, i've struggled with uh, 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 naming my novels and naming my characters you know i i, I wish i had salman rushdie's gift he's such a marvelous way of naming characters you no know? we uh, like mendak raja and who would think of <laughs> people like that so, uh, and this, uh, there have been a couple of occasions when when my editor has asked me to change the name of a character or uh, give a character a name so uh, but but having said all that, yeah, the hottest summer in years was easy because it was bang in the central, uh, in, in, in the heart of India, this place, or almost at the heart, uh, the heart of India, in uh, pre-independent India, if you look at Orkela on, on the map. And you know how summers can get very hot and winters can get just as uh, cold. And uh, yeah, and uh, in one hot summer, uh, in the course of one hot summer day, uh, uh, a strange death happens. So I, I thought that was apt, you know, naming it like that, and uh, yeah, I, and it evokes, I thought, so much about a place, a sense of the heat, the the feeling of being of perspiring, of being oppressive, of feeling claustrophobic. Uh, I, I and I and I left it at that, and my editor also uh, thought it was a good title, so that was it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's an evocative title, and I I, I think you know, titling is also an art. It's a real art. Whether it's titling a poem, a short story, you know, or a novel, like a book, 
it is. So let us reflect your question back onto you, Michelle. So how do you feel like your title gives a new way to understand Bombay or to reimagine that place? Uh, yeah, but as I, as I mentioned in the last, you know, the hangovers is in the realm of uh, intoxication. And Bombay, because, uh, you know, in we live in, in the reality of Mumbai, but uh, if you've lived long enough in the city, it was Bombay and then it became Mumbai. So I'm happy with both, uh, you know, names. But when you think about the past and you go walk down memory lane, it's always Bombay. When you live in the present or in the, even in the future, it would be future Mumbai. So, or some other name, who knows, you know, there would be another name, uh, Mumba maybe, you know, Mumba 2050. <laughs> so I am ready for anything uh, to happen. But, you know, I feel that the names are very superficial. It's like uh, the same philosophy about uh, reincarnations, you reincarnate cities and uh, the essence of the city comes from its heartbeats, which is its people. You cannot uh, just uh, title it the city the city titling, you know, can change, but you don't change the heartbeats. That's more important. That's where the city lies. And how would you, Rochelle, like to create a new narrative? What is your goal with this book in terms of the narrative of the place of Bombay? What would you like to do that no other Bombay-based writer has done so far? Uh, see, uh, see, there are many, many writers uh, who've written on Bombay and many will be writing. Even poetry, they, they do write. Uh, I think uh, with this book, I, I was trying to seek the... Uh, extraordinary in the ordinary, the quotidian life of uh, not just a city, a city because it's Bombay hangovers, but even life. You know, what is this everydayness? Because uh, uh, earlier I had this idea that I would be a magic realist uh, writer and I would write speculative, so soft sci fi. And I didn't think there was anything magical in realism. It, and now I realize that no, there is a lot of magic in realism. You don't need magic realism. Okay, so uh, there is a lot of magic in the, the very ordinary uh, life of people and even including yourself and your life. And I think we've seen this more in the lockdown when everything is muted, every other layer, you just live in one or two layers and you realize, no, life can still be very magical. So my exploration was to find that ordinary, uh, that magical ordinariness, that everydayness and to curate it, to curate its little details it's uh, which we think, oh, there's nothing new about this. But you read it after a while, after time passes by and you're like, this was a life that went by minute by minute. It was so interesting. It was not ordinary. You thought it was ordinary. It was not. It was very beautiful and magical, simple as ever. So I was, all, so th that's a way, also a way of, you know, collecting and collating this uh, in the stories of the characters. But of course, uh, I'm very uh, also very plot driven, not just character driven. So when I, when you talk of the art of uh, the art of the create the you know the art and craft, I do like plot. It's it's not like I can curate uh, these moments forever. I do need a turn or a bend with acts. So I'm very in that sense crafty <laughs> with with the plot. I don't like to give up plot. Um, so after a bit of descriptions, you are going to find uh, the act one, act two, and act threes. Uh, there will be obstacles and uh, rising stakes and there will be resolutions and characters will find something. They will go on a journey which will either destroy them or uh, change them. All that is there in place. I'm very much that cutter, staunch storyteller, you know, which, yeah. So that doesn't change, but yeah, I'm trying to explore. I'm trying to look at Bombay. Uh, uh, you know, this book that I have, the 16... Um, stories if you could think about it it's like uh, one stop on the western line one train station stop could have one story so there will be a story on Mahim. there's a story at Pedder Road there's a story at uh, Thane story at um, Malad Goregaon so that kind of a thing yeah so yeah, yeah. Go ahead. yeah uh, so a question for Rochelle so um, I mean, I actually you answered part of it in, uh, in your last the two sentences about setting the stops along the Western line. So are these, uh, I mean, uh, believe me, I'm, go I'm going to read the book soonest and I promise this. So uh, are these stories uh, of one genre, I mean, uh, or have you experimented across genres? Because you mentioned about wanting to write uh, speculative fiction and so that would be fascinating how you tried your hand at mixing up genres and the... Uh, yeah, no, so these these stories are all realism and, uh, you know, like based in Bombay. But uh, I have written separately uh, magic realism and speculative. So 
and you yeah, written para- paranormal ghost what is that you written poems also of course i've written poetry i've written poetry also and poetry is a magic realist genre because it's so abstract that it is a magic realist genre it's very speculative poetry but uh, i i i do write paranormal and ghost but once i started enjoying realism i realized i don't enjoy uh, magic realism or speculative as much you know yeah. so that was, that has been my gold chakkar or u turn uh, to genres lekin in this book uh, it you will have multi themes but you will not have multi genre this is all within the realms of realism Okay. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, and I want to say that that is something I think that uh, I've also found very interesting is making, taking something very real and trying to learn to represent in a way that can be like more than real and make the person want to be so engrossed in it as if it were something unreal. And I think to lose that suspension of what is the real, what life has to be, and to make that person fully immersed in a moment of experience, I think that is what we're all striving for at the end of the day. Right. That's true. That's true. So and you I think that pursuit is something that will keep us busy I think for life. <laughs> the attempt the the desire to try at least and do our best of course. Yeah. It's a lifelong pursuit and then once life ends well we don't know what we do after that. <laughs> But <laughs> at least at least something of the energy of that may go on. Right. Right. So I again I Thank you both. I've, I've actually uh, bought both of your books, and I'm really looking forward to reading them at some point once I'm mentally able to actually <laughs> read them. <laughs> But um, uh, regardless, um, normally we have a Q and A session towards the last 15 minutes of our, you know, with the audience. But both Vishal and Anu were asking me; they're very interested in something I've written yeah. and why I'm yeah. writing. So I just thought maybe if they want to ask me some questions, or should I like give a little bit of a more of an introduction of what it's about, and maybe read a little yes. bit, and then you can yes. ask your yes. question. Yes. So let me also I'll I'll try to share screen for a moment, so that way everyone can see what I'm referring to. Give me a second. Also, let me maybe add a new screen while I rather than do it in the same window, so you don't see all the other things I have up. <laughs> But anyways, I'm currently working. on a virtual novel called hirar hirar is a word which means to turn to turn in spanish and i wanted to create something that could be a full reflection on the world at once i wanted to create something that literally did not belong to one nation that could belong to all the different man made nations on this world without privileging one type of nationality or another and i wanted to create a live journal of times that's passing us by you know from now until the end of a decade so from 2000 uh, from tomorrow april 12 2021 or april 13th in india time but april 12th for us who are in the us um until the end of 2029 hidar is going to be streaming stories so people who choose to sign up you can um sign up here i'm already logged and it will say back to dashboard but you can um sign up here and then the first six stories are going to just come up from April 13th to April 17th and uh, then there'll be a full compilation of 30 that will come together and so for the people who sign up they'll get an email on the day and time of that story taking place and then they'll get the story you know like if it were as if it if you feel in Haiti or Turkey or wherever on that day on that time having the story come to life The stories themselves revolve around a mother and father. These are two archetypes I constructed that are a little bit based on some people I know, but are just works of fiction at the end of the day because I imagined it all. And it involves, you know, them trying to make peace with their life, you know, despite the fact of having a son who's very different from the norm and who's LGBT, who lives away from them, who's not doing a traditional work, and how they are trying to make peace with that over the course of a decade. and each story takes its archetypal mother and father and then reimagines them in a completely different cultural context and nationality it can go all the way from rajasthan to fiji to you know paraguay or wherever and it goes through all these different cultures and each installment readapts this greater archetypal story into a very specific cultural context so that each story is kind of enhancing augmenting the general theme of what's happening but through the kind of very specific cultural context of the mother and father in that very particular place and so each story comes together to kind of create this greater overarching story of how this family over a very slow burn of a decade is learning to forgive each other and learning to accept each other but also it's creating every little installment is a di- is like a little bit of a sketch of life in all these corners of the world and so and and it comes in different books and installations and it's going to play with a lot with multimedia and all that but currently it's just going to be kind of like you know you sign up and then you get these um eventually book 1 will have a lot more stories it will come in real time so it's not there now but 
currently you just have these toys like here, like here's one in Aditya Baba. And you know, uh, in order to access uh, the full thing, you have to, it is a monthly subscription form in which you pay about a hundred rupees a month to get access to the full thing. A uh, hundred rupees is not a particularly high amount of money. It's like how much you'd spend to eat biryani one day <laughs> at a restaurant <laughs> and just you choose not to eat that biryani and you just stay at home. But um, it's only for one month and I'm doing a lot of work. It's like I have to design all these things. I have to create all these images and videos in the future and multimedia stuff. And then the writing is also something I have to do, you know, so it's like every month I'm, I'm going to be doing at least like three or four of these in like these installations and just the first month is 30 of them so you can imagine over 10 years it's going to be a lot of content so this is a story in Songkran, Songkran in Thailand these are from last year by the way these are just sample stories for the people who want to read ahead of time but uh yes if if, if you all want I can read a piece of it as well and um I can also put a little bit of a link for people who are curious what does Girard mean Hidar means to turn in Spanish, yeah, the Spanish word. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it's to turn. Oh, okay. Gumna. But uh, in the context of, but Hidar as a word is interesting because yes, it's to turn around the whole world and to turn around the family at once. So it's a multifaceted turn. <laughs> okay. Were you inspired by, I'm sorry, I'm stopping you from reading. Yeah, yeah, please, please, please. It's fluid, no way. Were you inspired by, uh, some, by what, what inspired you to, uh create such a thing. I think it's like a mix of um, many things. One is I've lived in international life for so long now. I've been traveling since I'm 20, I'm 31 now, and I've been traveling almost for 10 years. And that happened when I was living in Spain and I just had this kind of epiphany in a mosque, church, synagogue in Segovia, where I was like, there's these three beautiful religions coming together in one building. Why not create the whole world in one novel? You know, like that same kind of fusion, that same kind of harmony, you know? And I didn't know how I was going to do it. I was only like 20 and I was in a, it was just like that, that thought in the back of my head that ultimately made me realize I want that's to travel. That's a very ambitious epiphany, no? It's yeah. a very ambitious one. Yeah. I, I, I liken it to a darshana sometimes, you know, it really yeah. just felt like I got this, this darshana and I just had yeah, this yeah. sudden, I have to do this greater thing for the world kind of moment, you know, just looking at this religious device. So <laughs> that's not Hindu, but still it's like a religious monument and then I look at it and something comes to me kind of. But anyways, I'm not religious, however, but that just, it, it has some feeling like that to me. But uh, yeah, and then I, I needed to travel. I needed to live a global life because I felt like if I'm going to write about all these different cultures, there's no way that I could do it just living in the US, you know, like which is where I was raised, you know, and it's, or living in Spain or living in India, any country, you know, there's no way that I could have done that. So I had to travel, I had to live all over the world and I, there's no way that I could have done that without living a global life. So I put my foot where my mouth is and I just went and traveled and lived in different countries and learned different languages. And I still am a little bit in that lifestyle, but yes, it was always with that idea of I wanted to create this greater work in mind. Okay. We're waiting for you to read. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I want to ask you, um, do you want me to read, um, you, you can give me a random country or part of the world, or I have a section in Haiti I just happened to pull, pull up. Do you want me to do the section in Haiti? Or? Whatever, I mean, yeah. whatever. Anything, anything that you, you choose for the moment. But I must say, I'm not gobsmacked as, as much as I'm globesmacked. <laughs> <laughs> You've been hit with a giant spear. <laughs> so let us do 80. The sun, this glaring midday sun. The moment mother stepped out onto the roof, a basket of wet clothes on her hip, she could feel herself burning up. In a way, it was her own fault. She had gotten into such an argument with Sun while helping him unpack that she had forgotten all about the laundry. She had been born and raised with this heat, but in the middle of the day, at her age, it was like the Sun wanted to permeate each and every one of her bones, even in all this wind. Sister Aithie was all Sun would say. That was what he had said yesterday about the crowded tap taps, the mud cake diets, the overflowing trash, the orphans without a home in all this empty space. She did not want to debate about such things with Sun, who in the last decade had become not only a foreigner, but the blandest kind of bland. She did not want to worry about it. She just wanted to hang the clothes and move on to the next pressing question. What was her lunch, pole or grillo? It was difficult to pin the clothes on such a blustery day. The wind swooped in from the Caribbean and was gunning for mother's blouses. No matter how many pegs she used, she had the sense that if she did not stay there to watch them, they would simply blow away. She knew how much sun prized these clothes, fetched from the rich side of the world, and how much she'd be yelled at if the wind bequeathed them onto the streets. She told herself she would hang some of them here, then put them on the rack in her bedroom. But by the time she had organized which clothes were going where, it seemed that the wind had stopped. In the still air, 
the sun felt even hotter, causing the creases and cracks in the stucco of the nearby houses to glisten. It had a beauty to it, these Haitian caves, the spick and span of houses made white simply to the years gone by, in which it had not seen a fresh layer of paint. Mother was struck by a strange and irresensible sense that too much time was passing. She was not one of these Haitians who lolled about outside the boutique and waited for the day to end. She made the decision to hang all her clothes in the sun, then she climbed back with her weak and scarred bone, her knees to the first floor, where she found son on the couch, unpacking books from a box. Mother didn't like how quiet it was, so she turned on the television. And uh, then they start speaking. If you want, I can go on, but that's just like uh, the first page or something. That was, okay. Fascinating thing. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was so interesting to see, oh my God, stories from all over the world. And that means all over history. Yeah. This is like a never ending project. You will need many lifetimes, Kiran. <laughs> <laughs> I need at least a decade. <laughs> you seem to stop. rotation and revolution. <laughs> you seem to stop right at the time when a, a confrontation was brewing between mother and son. <laughs> yes. So that will inspire you to want to read more, maybe. <laughs> if you want, I could read on. I could do another section, even. Do you want me to do another one so you could get a sense of another place that I chose? Oh, yeah. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Rochelle, yeah. are you okay, Rochelle? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely okay. Okay. So maybe this time give me like a general region and I'll just pick one from there. Asia, Asia. Okay, Asia. Which part of Asia? South, East, oh, Northwest? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Asia is a big part of the world. Then let's take South, South Asia. I'm just, I'm just curious oh, to see. We'll go back to the roots. All right, sure, fine. And we'll do the one for, oh, but then I don't know if I want to do the one for tomorrow though, because that oh. is a spoiler. Um, okay, why not? Why not? Well, anyways, you all are here and it's okay. So this is for, so the reason why um, this is going to be launching tomorrow is because of Ugadi. Ugadi is a Kanadaga New Year and it'll mm -hmm. start on uh, April 13th in the early morning, which for me in the US is like in the middle of the night, six and to 12th. So um, this is for Ugadi. Today was Ugadi, the Kanada New Year. It was a day to dine in the suite of Jaggeries, a day to decorate one's door with neem and mango leaves. It was a day to porch, to paint the porch with rangoli patterns and stench the hall with incense. It was a day of importance for anyone who was Kanadaga. For mother, it was a day to pray. Frankly, be it a festival, an auspicious occasion, or a public-related holiday, mother took any Indian day of importance quite seriously. She would spend all day watching the patriotic news programs on Republic Day, just as she would visit her native place in Kodugu to observe Dasara, Deepavali, or any birthday of a god. The coronavirus had changed much in India, but did not change mother's convictions. And so mother was sitting, cross-legged against her gate, painting rangolis and waiting for the archika to come. Father had left for the hospital around midnight, so mother was alone. She was taking extra care so the wind would not blow away the powder. It was five in the morning, an hour of the day late enough to be considered still night, but early enough to be considered already dawn. Just a few years ago, this modest bungalow of hers stood beside an empty grass yard in which the cows rested and dogs played, or an opportunistic Panipuri vendor set up his stall. But the land was purchased and developed into a modern apartment complex and was now populated with students. The students did not care about anything. Most of them did not even come from Karnataka. They had that North Indian rowdiness. They'd play loud music whenever they felt like it. They would swear loudly in Hindi and they shamed themselves in public, even at these odd hours. The locals of this humble street of Kuempunagara were all of the retirement age and could not abide the noise. And then there's more, but... <laughs> Very vibrant, very vibrant. And I think it's, it's you are revisiting these places as well. Yes, yes. Because they're places that I've lived in or part of, but also just random. Like Haiti, I've just visited once and it's just a random place. But still, um, yes, it's like reimagining as well, like from what you know of that place into this other context. This is an ambitious project. All the best with it. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, one question, uh, Kiran, all yeah. these... Uh, Places that you write about, are there places uh, that you know better than others? And oh, how easy or difficult was it to write about places you've just visited once um, for a few days? How easy is it to, uh, to juggle these you know, places you know well and places you uh, just know from um, sudden visits? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated, you know, there's two questions. One is, is there places I know better than others? Obviously, they are. Like Mysore is a place I'm so close to. I've been visiting it since I was a little boy. It's part of my formation. And so, yeah, obviously, I feel, I mean, when I imagine the house, I imagine very much a house I know and know well, you know. So that's different. 
a place like Haiti, I've only visited as a tourist. I have a very superficial interaction with it. And so obviously my amount of knowledge is much less. And the place I'm imagining is maybe just an imagined space that's coming out of a collection of memories, images, and things I research off the internet. So obviously that feeling is there. Uh, they're different, I mean. That being said, surprisingly enough, when it comes to writing, uh, it doesn't always necessarily add up as, as uh, simple as you think. Sometimes, I don't know, sometimes it's just about the story and what you're trying to create in that yeah. moment and what is the conflict you're creating and just through that. I mean, there's some stories that have come off really well and I had no, like, I even remember a few years ago when I was still writing this in workshop and I was living in Mumbai and I had written some sections and some friends had rented. Some of them were in South Korea. Others were, I mean, one section was in South Korea and other was in Mumbai and um, everyone felt that the South Korean section was more authentic than the Mumbai one, even though I was living in Mumbai and I, I had never, I'd been to four, South Korea four times, but not as a traveler, right? So it's, um, it's not always as simple as well, you know, mm -hmm. I know Mumbai, but I've lived in Mumbai for a year or something and I, I've only visited Korea, but something about the city or the experience is more pressing to you and it just inspires you more. Mm -hmm. Like maybe even you all relate to this as well. You just have a very key moment in, you know, in Hong Kong or Prague and that, is more than a whole year in New Jersey, you know? So it's like, um, it's not as cut, uh, clear cut as you might think. And, and I think then that is with people as well, right? I mean, sometimes yeah. you would you would hang out with someone and, and nothing, uh, you know, it would be an uneventful kind of hanging out, of whatever kind. And you would meet a person and that could be life-changing <laughs> in a day. So the cities and people are always very similar. I had a question. Uh, Kiran, you've traveled so much. We always know about the, you know, the dissimilarities of places. What is the similarity between all the places you've traveled in? Is it even that's, possible to have? That's a, that? that's a very difficult answer. And it's something that's come up in several interviews. What is the core thing? You know, I don't know if I, it's this interesting thing that I've been replace, uh, replicating in my head is, I don't know if it's that all places are similar or not. Or no, it's more that rather that there are certain things that we see in a place and then we relate to it given to our context. And then we reimagine that place and we relate to it given what we know. And so the key is in a book like this is how do I do that space of like taking this kind of abstract thing that's thousands of years old and we're just playing with and then tie it to something more primal, tying it to something more like quote unquote human, you know, through these archetypes. And so I think for me, it's more taking this very primal, urgent like thing that's inside of me and using it to connect to something else or across all these places. But it's not necessarily that there's something unifying the places. It's more that I'm trying to recreate that feeling no matter where the place is. So this seems like a traveler's point of view always. And it, then you seem to be like the modern Marco Polo. <laughs> That's what I don't go with the intent of like taking people's land or like selling things. <laughs> no, <laughs> like... But Marco Polo. <laughs> but the thing is, yeah, because it seems to be the traveler's point of view. Like you, you, you are, could even say like it's like a little bit whatever's like... Whatever's in yeah. your baggage is, is yeah. what is the place, right? Yes, I could even... You make, unpack. Yes. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to say, Anno? No, uh, no, no. Yeah, okay. So you, you, you still wanted to say something, but uh, no, no, yeah, no. I, I just I was just extending that same sentence. Please continue, Anu. Yeah. Because uh, no, it's uh, it's interesting what you said, uh, Kiran, uh, about a certain key moment in a place bringing uh, that place alive. Uh, and I sort of remembered something Rochelle had said right at the beginning. Rochelle, didn't you say something that uh, noise itself is a character in your book? Uh, I yes, think, yes, a character in that story. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it we fast. I mean, I, I wish you would tell us a bit more how noise in Bombay, the oral sounds of that city, how is it different from other cities? Because Bombay, I know, is unique in that sense. You know, because the, the Ganpati festival, the traffic noise, everything is so different. So right. I'm just very really curious to know more uh, about this noise aspect of it if you can yeah see uh, see when i've lived in uh, other cities of course not as much as kiran has but i've lived in few other world cities and of course their noise levels are high because the city city has high noise level but nothing compared to bombay yeah. and uh, nothing compared to those deafening uh, sounds that you can hear even sometimes in the ordinary peak hours right i mean peak hour traffic I'm not even talking of the Ganpati festivals or the, or the Diwali, uh, you know, celebrations or wedding celebrations. I'm talking of the simple everyday traffic honking and you're on a busy intersection and that, uh, that. So I feel we get used to the noise in such a way that it doesn't exist. Somebody outside will be like, what is a train sound going? And you're like, there is a train sound. 
and it's like happening every five minutes. Da, 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 da. Yeah. <laughs> You're not aware of it. So how does it seep to the background? What is noise? And uh, you have this uh, the city, which is a clock in itself. It's not just the sun and the moon, which is rising and falling, which is a clock. Uh, but you have the city as a clock, and that's why I've shown in this uh, character, yeah. uh, in in the character K, D'Souza, noise is how she clockworks her day, and her whole day's routine is based on the factory siren, and you know, the milkman coming in, or some children playing in the society is the evening for tea. She's clockwork the city inside her, and that's what we do when we don't even know it. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, makes me think how how noise itself has uh, traveled through history. You know the concept of noise, but we're not. I mean, I mean, I never thought of it like this. So th thanks, you. And, and do you play with noise, Anuradha, in any way in your books in terms of making a place come alive? Not so much noise. No, I mean, Rochelle has made me think about it in ways never before. So uh, it's such an insight. But uh, yeah, the atmosphere. You know, the sense of heat, uh, the the quiet of the night, the intensity of the night. I, I try to evoke uh, the atmosphere and the sound of silence, if I might uh, borrow that song, <laughs> the title of that song. So, uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, the sound uh, of quietness is what I try to evoke. Uh, how, how, uh, how in that quiet, uh, especially, I don't want to give too much away, especially how in this novel, uh, he wonders whether he has misheard uh, in that quiet a certain noise. So... In that sense, yes, uh, but not uh, with with such. Intense... That's so that's so fascinating that you talk about the sound of silence and you yeah. trying to articulate the sound of silence in the writing. So yeah. that in itself is so difficult, right? Actually, yeah. So yeah, uh, I mean, the one thing that I try not to repeat. I mean, it's such a, a lazy writer's thing to do the buzz of insects and. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the intensity of the street light uh, lamps. I mean, those are such cliched things. So I tried to go. I, I mean, not not that. not after Kolatka's uh, traffic signals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he he kind of <laughs> took it took it away. Yeah, I, I I you know I just read that poem. It was in the boat ride, right? Uh, I happened to be in a Kolatka frame of mind some two three days ago. Yeah. And I workshop that poem so because I think he he did it with those street lights. No one else could touch street lights after that. So everyone, we're just going to pause the recording for now. This is for the one hour because the one hour has passed. But if anyone else has any questions about these projects, please feel free to keep throwing them at each other. But I just will stop the recording and thank the people who will be watching this as a YouTube video.